Greetings. I'm Mark Kennedy, director of the Wab Institute for Strategic Competition here at the Wilson Center. Pleased to be here with this program partnered with the Middle East Institute here at the Wilson Center. And today we're exploring the Israeli economy. As conflict rages across the Middle East, it's important for us to keep an eye on a long-term future. Finding a settlement, I'm sure, will be complex, but an important ingredient of that will be the economic economy of Israel. It's the strongest economy in the region. It's shown how you can bloom in the desert. It is an attraction to the others in the region as a partner, as a way of trade. So it's important, whatever we're going to find as a long-term solution, that the economy continues strong. And we're very pleased to have with us here today the Minister of Finance for our embassy, Noak Hacker. Uh, he's had senior roles in both the private industry as well as government, and we're pleased that he's able to share some insights with us. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you, and it's hard to imagine everything that's going on back in your country. But when you think about, to begin with, the workforce, you not only had the schools closed for the first month, but you had an activation of, of several uh, hundred thousands worth of reservists, another several hundred thousand have had to be evacuated away from the borders of conflict. And uh, we also have suspended the work permits uh, for many coming from the Palestinian territories. All of those together have to have a major impact on the workforce. Uh, how's that uh, being handled and what kind of an effect does that have on the budget? Again, thank you for having me here and thank you for the question. I'll start with explaining in a couple of words how the Israeli economy started this war. And in the eve of the war, like October 6th, if we'll say, Israel's economy was the strongest it's been ever. Uh, you, you're talking about workforce. We've been around 3% unemployment rate, which is an all-time low in Israeli economy. Uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio was uh, under 60%, very low. We barely had a deficit in the, in the government budget. And growth, uh, our, our economy grew in the last couple of years, more like more than most in 2021, 2022, we're talking about near 15% growth, which is huge. And also in 2023, the projection was uh, about 3% growth. So we were in a very, very good and stable position. And then the war started. And as you said, the, one of the strongest effects in the beginning of the war was on the job market. Uh, when we look at it now in a perspective of a couple of months, uh, there's a lot of reports being issued on the matter from the Bank of Israel and the Ministry of Finance. What the Bank of Israel found is that most, uh, the, the deepest effect on the economy was from, as you said, closing the schools. What happened, you had families where one spouse was called to reserves and the other one had to stay home with the kids because the school was clo were closed. That accounts for more than half of the effect that the Bank of Israel found on the economy. Uh, and fortunately that, of course, after a couple of weeks, the school reopened and that effect uh, went, uh, went on and, and stopped uh, having this negative effect on the Israeli economy. What stayed is for the first time in Israeli conflict, we had to uh, relocate uh, communities, border communities to the center of Israel. That has an effect and it's still going on. But you have to understand when you're talking about moving someone from Kibbutz Be'eri, which is on the border with Gaza that was hit by this horrible ter terrorist attack, to move him to Tel Aviv, it's about 20, 30 minute drive. So it doesn't have, it's not like moving someone from Washington State to uh, New York. It's, it's very close. So if you work on the Intel uh, factory in Kiryat Gat, then you're still continuing if, you, if uh, I'm not talking about the actual effects of the terrorist attack, but if, if, you're, if you're able, you're, you're, uh, you're continuing your work. It, it mostly affected uh, small businesses that were uh, located in, in that area, and the Israeli innovation helped with that by issuing new apps uh, to connect between businesses that uh, had to evacuate from uh, borders to demand that is around the center of Israel, uh, which is a very nice thing. But, and, and so that's another effect. The, the third effect of reserves, which is uh, significant, 
uh, we found that most reserves are students uh, and their effect on the job market is uh, not as high as you would have think because they're not in work and working they're not working yet uh, and in the high-tech uh, sector because of covid and its effects on working being able to work from remote and a couple of adjustments the army made like setting up uh, we work tents uh, in uh, army bases it helped uh, those uh, high-tech workers staying connected to their investors, their customers. So it has an effect, but it's a less effect than you would have think. Uh, and also now we are starting to see reserves returning to their homes. So now the effect is even lower than it was uh, a month or two ago. The only effect that we see as something that uh, stays with us even today, as you said, is uh, Palestinian workers. Uh, and that's in specific sectors. The most affected sectors from, are for that is construction and agriculture. What we see in construction is the most impact uh, uh, on the, let's say, the weekly or monthly product. Uh, uh, it's tens of thousands of Palestinian workers that used to work there. And, uh, and the agriculture, it's a little less, but again, also around 10,000 of workers. So, so what the government did is two, two, men, two very important steps. The first step is more short term, issuing out grants about $3,000 for Israeli workers that decide to come and work in these sectors for, uh, let's say, up to three months. So if you come to three months, you get $3,000. That is supposed to help with, uh, with the short term and the longer term is starting negotiations with different countries around the world or bringing other foreign workers to replace uh, the Palestinian workers and that's been going on. Some of it already started with a couple of thousand and some of them the negotiations are still going on but that's the, the, the most of the problem is going to be solved in that, in that way. Uh, so we're having difficulties, it has changes but again if you take a look at the projections or how it's going to affect the economy going forward, then you see that the growth projection for Israel now, if the conflict stays the way it is, uh, mainly in Gaza, we're talking about still positive growth of 1.6%, and uh, the OECD, I think, uh, projects 1.5%, but they both... The government, the Bank of Israel, and the OECD predict that 2025 is going to be a very fast recovery. We're going to see high growth. So we've had a, a major impact at, to begin with that's been lessening. The government's taking measures to try to mitigate it. We'll talk about the budget impact in just a second here. But, you know, you've got a very talented workforce. When you think about it, Israel has 140 scientists and technicians per 10,000 employees. That's compared to 85 per hundred per thousand, 10,000 here in the U.S. and 83 in Japan. So uh, amongst the highest concentration of high-tech workers, they're, they're in great demand everywhere. Uh, how is Israel doing in terms of retaining them in Israel, given everything else that's going on in the world? So, First of all, the high-tech sector in Israel is very unique. You hardly see any influence uh, on the on the high-tech sector with war and even COVID, the high-tech sector continues to grow. And that's what we are seeing now. We don't see that much an effect on, a high -tech, on the high-tech sector with this war. It's still, it's still soon, we're just a couple of months, but uh, we, we're starting to see data and it doesn't seem like it's a big effect. On the people part, I don't know if you saw it, but all the uh, polls about or surveys about uh, how are you, how much are you happy in your country? I think it was the, la the, last, uh, 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 the last convention of the World Economic uh, Organization. They showed the poll where Israel is fourth amongst countries. The 2022 or 2023 uh, uh, polls put Israel the number four. People are very happy in Israel. And also we have a, a different character. You know, most people, when they hear of something happening, a war or something, something dangerous, they run away. Israelis, when we hear our nation is in trouble, we all come back to Israel. And we saw a very uh, strong move of people to Israel just after the October 7 attack because we understand the importance to Israel for all Jewish people and for the Israelis 
and we're not going to give that up. So uh, we're not, uh, we, Israelis are happy in Israel. So the reverse of what you might expect has happened in terms yeah. of uh, retention of talent. Uh, foreign investment trends, you know, th th I understand that the foreign investment had been slackening a bit prior uh, to the conflict. Uh, you had the biggest investment ever with a $25 billion plant by Intel. Uh, how do you see this conflict impacting foreign direct investment into Israel? As you said, this is a very uh, difficult time for foreign investments because of the part of it is the uh, high rates that we see in the markets today. Uh, we're coming out after a couple of years of almost no rate, well, zero rate. And now it's starting to be a high rate uh, environment and we see it affecting on, for on foreign investments. And we saw it in 2023 before the war. Uh, there were other effects in Israel, uh, uh, more, uh, there were internal disputes in Israel, but I think in that way, the October, after the October 7, we're in a better place than we were before. And uh, as you said, the Intel investment, it's something that happened actually a month ago after the war. It didn't, it's, so we see that as a very good sign on what's coming. But uh, one of our uh, discussions here with the, the administration and, and America in general is seeing how can we increase American investments in Israel because we'll need a lot of investments in Israel. And I think it's, and, and it's not a, it's an economic decision. And I think when people, you know, the Israeli stock market rose from before the, from the, after the war till now by tens of percents, like I think it's 20 something percent. So to invest in Israel, it's a very smart economic decision. And we hope that Americans will see it and we hope uh, we find a way to increase American investment in Israel because it's important to the Israeli economy, to the American economy, and uh, strengthening Israel's and America's uh, economic relationship, it's a very good sign to the world to show that the civilized economies come out of this conflict even stronger than they were before. We'll undoubtedly need a lot of investment throughout the region uh, in the months and years ahead. Um, tell me, financing for the government, mm -hmm. uh, how has this all impacted uh, the deficit, the, the debt, uh, the ability of the government to finance this? Uh, this conflict, this war, probably is the, has the highest costs that we've ever experienced in war in Israel, at least in the last couple of decades. Uh, we're seeing costs in about 200 billion shekels, which comes out to 40, 50 billion dollars. Uh, some of them already paid in two, 2023. That's why we saw uh, the deficit rise. As I said, we started with almost no deficit, 1%, something like that. And we, we finished 2023 in about 4%, 4.2% deficit. Uh, the, the, because of the debt to GDP ratio was very low coming in. Uh, we finished uh, 2023 in about 62%, which still, but still is very low compared to in all the other countries. And that's what we're going to see in 2024. A lot of steps taken by the government to free up budget to the, the costs of war and a rise in deficit, about 6% deficit that will bring a, a, a rise in the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, the latest prediction is that Israel is going to finish 2024 with about 68% debt to GDP ratio with again still very low compared to other countries. Uh, but we're still in the process of approving the new budget. In Israel, in order to keep up with the costs of war, we updated the budget to 2023 about a month ago and to 2024. The 2024 new budget has passed in the government and supposed to pass in the Knesset, which is our Congress, in the next month. Uh, so we hope that uh, fiscal responsibility is one of our uh, greatest uh, objectives in Israel because we know the meaning of it, we know the signal it sends to the uh, global economy, to investors, to rating companies. So uh, we're trying to be very, very careful and very, very responsible. And I think you see it in the data. Uh, but again, it's a very, the cost of this war are very, very high. Very high. Now, in the long run, we, we're looking for, you know, a peaceful region. 
with all the uh, members of the region uh, coming together and having economic prosperity for all. That's going to take Israel having good relations with its regional partners. Uh, right before this conflict began, for example, the G20 mentioned having an India, Saudi Arabia, uh, Middle East, uh, Israel, uh, Europe uh, transit corridor, which would be just one of many economic opportunities that could be unlocked if all the partners could work together. What is Israel doing to help maintain those relationships during this turmoil to keep those prospects for collaboration open? Uh, first of all, I'm a free economy uh, uh, believer. So we see the economy continuing to work. Even now, between different countries and Israel, uh, the economic relationships continues. And uh, I can tell you something which is very interesting on this specific project. President Biden announced it, uh, the IMEC. I think it's a very important project. And I think what we're seeing now, how Iran funds uh, the Houthi to disturb the global trade uh, as an as a act of uh, war or attacking uh, the global economy, I think that all that is another reason why this project is so important, and we're starting to see. We're, we're, it's not talked about a lot, but in Israel, I, I heard a couple of interviews with the CEOs of logistic companies that that are saying that this route between Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel is already at work. Not the big project, not trains, not but and trucks and different ways the economy works. So if there is the economic incentive, uh, we see it working and I am truly, I'm, I believe in that and we're starting to see it happen. So you see how someone tried to use World Trade against us and now you see it pushing forward on maybe one of the most important projects, the IMAC project, uh, that uh, hopefully will come in the future. So I'm optimistic that the economy will win over, over terror. And IMAC, of course, being that India, Middle East uh, yeah, corridor, corridor that is going forward. Hopefully, if we, one of the many things that could be unlocked uh, as we move into a peaceful state in the future, which is our hope. Uh, U.S. supplemental, the White House has requested a supplemental. It's uncertain where that stands, how it would get through. But why is that important to Israel? Explain what's the importance of that to your country. I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain it. I'm, I'm a basketball fan. I play, I play basketball, I watch basketball, and the way I see it, it's like you're a part of a basketball team and during the game you find yourself on the floor. And then your teammate comes and reach out his hand and pulls you up. You can get up by yourself, but your friend coming, it's also it's helping you in a difficult situation, but also it shows the team spirit. It shows the, the unity of the team. And I think that's the importance of the supplemental we're talking about. We believe it's going to pass. We know that it's, the Congress supports it very much. There are some internal issues that we're not a part of on different discussions than the assistant to Israel. But that's the way we see it, because we're a very strong and stable economy. But uh, I think that shows the support that Israel gets the, and the connection between Israel and the United States more than the, the fact that it's going gonna, it's gonna to help Israel and it's going to help Israel. But uh, Israel is very strong and the economy is very resilient. And we see it in funding a 200 billion dollar, a billion shekels. So, but again, uh, it's, it's very important to us. This support, this uh, message to the world of our strong relationship, of the strong bond between the U.S. economy, between the Israeli economy, and I think that's the most important thing in the supplemental, and that's why I hope to see it pass uh, in the near future, and that's what we expect. Well, Minister Hacker, we very much appreciate you being with us to share more insight as to state of the economy during this period of conflict. Uh, we at the Wilson Center, uh, we in, in America, hope that we can bring all the civilizations throughout that region together in a positive way, but I'm believing that economy being strong and an attractive force to other partners is a part of that long-term solution. Again, I'm Mark Kennedy. This is the Wilson Center, co-sponsored by the Middle East Institute and Waba Institute for Strategic Competition. Thank you for being with us today.